Good morning, folks in London and around Europe, and midday to folks outside Europe and folks joining from India. Uh, I am Sham Sundar Ramasamy, security researcher with Umbrella Research Group. We're gonna. I'm a TEDx speaker, reverse engineer, conference speaker, and the big Batman fan. So. <laughs> Uh, we're going to speak about crypto mining, the cyber gold mining, uh, talk about some myths about crypto mining, all the buzzwords that you've heard so far, what's blockchain, what's crypto mining, and what is, of course, crypto malware, and how legal or illegal is to mine the coins using someone else's resource and how these find a place in your computer. We're going to talk all about it from scratch. I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited too. Okay, let's get started with some history. Bear with me with some history. Uh, cryptocurrency uh, is basically a no central system. Our traditional currency that we have today, be it a credit card or a currency, be it a rupee or a pound or a dollar, it's been issued by a bank, uh, some bank or some government. So the government prints the notes based on weighing gold and what's the gold rate and in some countries you just print it. So there's a central body or a system that gives you an identity saying that this citizen uh, can register to a bank and get a bank account. And uh, then you start transferring money and stuff. But in a cryptocurrency, technically there's nothing like that. There's no, there's no governing body, there's no central system. It's a bunch of trusted people who create this currency, mine the currency, which we're gonna talk about. And that's how it works. Now that's why it's shot up pretty massive uh, because the black market and the malware authors use it a lot. Everybody might have heard about ransomware. People say that ransomware was the hot topic at one point of time because and ransomware sometimes became untraceable, the payment system, because it went to a Tor network. People paid using bitcoins or cryptocurrency. Now that's what we're going to talk about saying that how that payment system works. But if it was in a normal, say I go to a Barclays bank or some bank in India or the US to Chase bank and I make a transaction, it's a centralized system. And if I do a ransomware attack and I give my bank account number saying, hi, transfer $1,000 to my account, it's going to be easily traceable. Now that's where the system differs from the no central system, no single party and that's how it's being played in the black market. We're going to talk all about that in the next slide, what happens. Okay, the Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin came into existence uh, way before everybody knew about it. So people say it just shot up in 2009. That was not the fact. It's been there for a while. Uh, it was being used in a different way by the open source developers where they were having these coins and then the black market and the malware orders found a value to it. Uh, it is actually invented by Satoshi Nakamoto. It's not a person, it's like a myth basically. It's a group of people who suddenly came together and said, why do we have to depend on somebody to have a central system? Let's decentralize the whole thing. And that was called as a peer-to-peer -peer system, which I'm going to explain in the next slide. So the, the way this works, the whole uh, transaction and stuff works using an old school ledger way. Uh, imagine it's like a small diary or a notebook where everybody has it and uh, if I make a transaction it's recorded there. It's quite bizarre that how it works but it's really really secure which we're going to talk about in the next slide. Okay, let's take an example. Let's do this. Look at the table. Um, it's a round table. So like a bunch of people sitting. So like two people decide to transfer twenty dollars or twenty pounds or twenty euros to each other because they don't have cash. In the traditional banking system it's gonna be like the person comes and asks the other person saying hey can I have your account details I need to transfer money to you. So he gives an account details to him and then he transfers the money. What exactly happens in this case is you do not get the money at the snap of your finger. It's gonna take a while because you're going to use a banking provider, a service provider, where uh, it's going to be a bank, where when you transfer the money, you have to add the other person's account number. That gets verified. And then a transaction is actually made. When a transaction is made, it's going to look at your account number, if it's a valid account number, if the other person's account number is valid, and so on. And then finally, the money gets transferred. What if I blow your mind saying that? There's none of these things that in this Bitcoin transfer or a cryptocurrency. 
imagine the same table people sitting around the bitcoin transaction or a transaction works a different way everybody has a ledger in their hands and uh, for example if one person wants to transfer a bunch of coins or make a transaction to the other person it is just going to note down in their ledger saying that i gave this to them so meanwhile when this is happening each of them makes the transaction noted in their ledgers once that is made the copy of the ledger goes to everybody and everybody is updated even if someone denies the fact and says that no i didn't get the money it's not all possible because you cannot tamper a record and you cannot deny that the transaction never happened so because each time when a transaction is made everybody around the table basically gets the ledger so the way of maintaining a ledger and uh, the transaction process and how it's stored is basically the blockchain that's the buzzword you keep hearing oh it's blockchain uh, i might disappoint a bunch of people saying that blockchain is not tied to a cryptocurrency transaction you can do a lot of wonderful stuff with blockchain that i'm going to talk in the next slide so this is how it works so this is simplified probably 155 page of blockchain books into just 50 words maybe okay so let's go to the next so i would actually thank springwise i picked up this slide from there because it's a very good picture in the presentation of what uh, uh, all the keywords in a transaction is so we spoke about how somebody does this so a block is actually a package of data that's a permanent record of a transaction. If a transaction is made, the evidence that the transaction was made is actually a package of data that's going to be there. That's that's the key thing. A node. So I showed you a table example where people were sitting around and doing together, uh, making a transaction and verifying a transaction, adding it to a ledger. These are guys a bunch of nodes. So imagine all these people sitting in a meeting room and you have 15 different meeting rooms of people doing the same thing they can connect to each other using networking and nodes and that's actually a pool basically it's called as a mining pool so confirmation so probably what happens when somebody makes a transaction and the transaction is verified by this bunch of people in the room it's called as a confirmation saying that the transaction is confirmed so i spoke about the ledger right old school notebook that they have a way of recording a data inside that record which can never be altered. That's actually a ledger saying that the transaction was done. I'm sorry, I'm writing it inside this record, this ledger. It can never be deleted or erased. It's 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 pretty strong. That's why it's it's the most powerful thing that people can't break into it or you don't know. Uh, distribution, as I said, when you make a transaction, you distribute your ledger saying, make sure that all the other ledgers are synced up so that you distribute that to people saying, it's like a database, for example. So it's going to spread across to other different computers say the transaction was made. Uh, we keep hearing the word transaction, that is the data that's sent to one form or the other, or the money is being sent from one Bitcoin address to another Bitcoin address. Uh, proof of work is basically like a hash. So what I'm going to talk about that in the next slide though, but a hash is like saying that, that a block work has been done and a block was actually mined. So this transaction was verified using a bunch of mathematical calculations and that's a proof of work. So it's basically SHA-256 encrypted and it's pretty hard to break. And each time when they do a proof of work or an encryption on a block, it's gonna be different so that nobody finds about it. It's very hard to break it. Uh, a computer who does this calculation saying that, uh, did I get a coin? Okay, I'm gonna verify this transaction is legal is basically a miner. So the funny part is, or the bizarre f fact is, if you are a miner and you are involved in verifying a transaction or calculation, your reward is going to be a Bitcoin. That's how the new Bitcoins are generated. I found the site really useful in Springwise because they put it pretty clearly with all this uh, data and images. So thanks to Springwise for that. Okay, what do we go next? Oops, what happened? Okay. Okay, blockchain. Let's come to the big myth thing. What's blockchain? I spoke a lot about blockchain. We spoke about the ledger. So technically what happens is when when you calculate how a Bitcoin is generated or transaction is verified, it's pretty fast. So I, I heard some stories saying that the light coins were the most fastest one. It took 11 minutes to verify transaction. So Sometimes the blockchain also depends on the way and the speed that a transaction is verified, making it faster for people who prefer light coins and like a lot of different coins. 
we spoke about mining as like a process of verifying a transaction and adding it to a public ledger. Note this point. So it's actually a public ledger. Sometimes these public ledgers, you can make a transaction, verify a transaction, and add that to a public ledger somewhere. Even though it's actually public, you can add transactions or read from it. Somebody from outside can never see that. So that's what we're going to talk about, Monero coins and all those things. That's that's the beauty of uh, these transactions. Um, so what is this Bitcoin mining that they, people keep saying, Bitcoin mining, mining? Bitcoin mining is actually a process of adding a record to the blockchain that we spoke about. It's like adding a block of data or a record to the ledger, that's the blockchain, and they're just spreading it out. People say it happens every 10 minutes and, 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 and so on. Now, uh, the Hyperledger is actually a framework that's uh, an open source people use like for this blockchain environment like a wallet and do these things. Uh, you might be wondering, we speak about this verification, transactions, what people are doing, how they're doing it. There is an equipment and a hardware specific for this. You can purchase this hardware online in eBay, eBay Amazon and all those things. You can actually buy mining hardware at your home and start mining coins. But why do we have a malware perspective here? Well, it's like you can watch movies home in Netflix with your internet connection. What if I use my neighbor's internet connection and watch Netflix? Well, that's bad. That's what these people try to do here. Using someone else's computer resource to mine a coin and add it to your wallet is no it's not an achievement of sorts, so it's definitely not an achievement. So that's what is called as illegal mining, and this is how the whole Bitcoin mining becomes uh, illegal. That's what people do today. So uh, we spoke about a lot of things. Uh, so people can ask this question. So can I tamper into this, big, uh, this blockchain network and see what the ledger is, how the ledger looks? Uh, it's actually called as a difficulty of the network. The term is called as a difficulty of network. Uh, people who feed this data to it keep changing the encryption mechanisms and the hash that is generated each time keeps changing so that it's very hard to guess what hash they're using. Uh, you can also use your computer hardware using a software called as GUI Miner to mine coins, but use your own hardware to mine coins, not someone else's hardware. Now. What happened? So Coin Hive was a big business model that disrupted the whole disrupted the whole uh, business chain. Now what Coin Mine start Coin Hive started doing was they so everybody knows what SaaS is a platform as a service. In uh, SaaS is software as a service, IaaS is infra as a service. Well, there's something called as malware as a service too. So what happens is they're like malware authors who rent their uh, infrastructure to people so that they can infect others and so on. So this coin mine was not a malicious kind of thing, but the coin mine had a business model. Coin mine, what they started doing was, I will give you the infra a bunch of JavaScripts that mines coin for you. You can put that coin mining scripts in your browser to mine coins. Now what happens is when somebody visits a website it's going to use their CPU power to mine coins. So CoinMine started saying, CoinHive started saying that I take 30% of the transaction that you make, you take the 70%. So it's like a piece of script that's going to run in a business computer. For example, many of them watch football here or cricket here. Uh, say, for example, BBC is a very famous uh, site that everybody, pe people just go to that and visit it. Or there's tubes running in London. Say there's a very small site that gives you a tube schedule saying that when the tra tube was stopped, the train was stopped. And what if somebody's actually running this coin I service there? People are going to visit that site and for that frame of window, your CPU shoots up. Someone is using your hardware resource to mine bitcoins. And then once you close the window, the service dies. That's pretty illegal. So that's what coin I started uh, rolling it as a service. And Monero was actually widely used. CoinHive uh, predominantly works with Monero and it's very hard to trace. Monero was used in ransomware. Uh, Monero actually uses the proof of mechanism that I uh, told about and it's very, 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 very hard uh, to track it. 
attacks like WannaCry use this as a payment source uh, because Monero is also a cryptocurrency. It differs from Bitcoin and it's very hard to, you know, trace it. So that's how CoinHive model. I'm going to show you how CoinHive is embedded in someone's uh, script. And I'm just going to show you a quick example of what actually is called a script jacking. So when you have an outdated software like WordPress or any of these Apache vulnerabilities running in your computer, you can do two things. Take a backdoor of your computer, compromise the server, either host ransomware, phishing mails, and a bunch of stuff. Now, if, if you're going to do all those things, you've got to send out that URL to an email and the user has to click the document and download it and stuff. Now, what's, the, what's, the, what's the most best? new thing to keep quiet. Stay quiet, do a bunch of stuff, is coin mining. So what people use is in this diagram, if you see, a threat actor basically compromises a server and he silently embeds a crypto mining script. That crypto mining script is going to be running without any noise. So the logic is like, the user is going to visit the site, say for like seven minutes, it's going to use his hardware mine coins and he's going to get a Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency. This goes on. Imagine if there's a popular site that's being used here is going to generate tons of traffic and all these coins are getting mined. There was actually an incident that happened in Brazil where in the Brazil airport a Starbucks site and the Wi-Fi was actually compromised. People who connected to the Starbucks Wi-Fi their systems were using for crypto mining, were used for crypto mining, and that was actually a major incident that happened. It can be anything. Uh, it can be even as simple as saying, what if YouTube was compromised? Everybody watches YouTube for a long time, or Netflix compromised, and they're running CoinHive script. Everybody connects to Netflix and watches. Imagine it's going to use your CP power to mine coins. Well, that's, that's how crypto jacking works. Now, we spoke about these things. Uh, I, I actually covered a bunch of stuff here already. Monero, it's untraceable. Why threat actors lie with it? And the CoinHive business model works in favor of them. So CoinHive also came up with the statement saying that you can put a privacy statement on your site saying that we would be using these scripts to mine coins if you're okay with it. Well, who reads these things these days? Nobody reads it. Nobody reads terms of agreement and I agree to the following step and just press agree. Nobody reads it. So that was one, and uh, sites like WordPress, mainly people who are targeted here are like small scale industries who have uh, a cake, a cake store, that's a small store somewhere, and they have, a, everybody has a site, and outdated sites are compromised, and they're being used to, you know, mine coins. Okay, I just love this part always when I come. This is actually an example. So one fine day, what happened was, I had a domain that was submitted by one of our customers and they said, I mean, uh, can you just look at it, it's a little strange. And I actually dug into the site and I found, they have like two sites. One was this proxyfill.info, the other was actually a happy birthday song. So this is the very funny fact. So happy birthday song is a free site where you can send a recipient uh, a happy birthday song if it's their birthday. It's gonna be two and a half minutes long video and they play it. That's going to be playing from their site with your name accessed in it. So that site was basically compromised and was actually running CoinHive scripts. So you have a good window of nine minutes where to seven minutes or three minutes where this song is going to play and that's going to use your CPU memory. This is what I did. So what we quickly did, our team also did this was they quickly opened the CPU memory usage and ran the site and it shot up massively. So now this is confirmed saying that if you just see down, this is an embedded script from CoinHive just running here and when you access the site, how your CPU memory shoots up. Well, this is how it actually works. So there are like actually two ways of uh, doing it. So one way, so everybody's seen this, right? This is one way is to use your CPU. And the other way is a very interesting fact is using a GPU. What if 
everybody plays games. Everybody plays high-end games in your computer or online games. What if uh, you're watching a 3D movie, or what if you're watching, or or what if you what if I'm sorry, you're playing a game which is an online game which uses your GPU. GPU is more powerful, high-end graphic cards. Everybody has it. So say you play for one hour and it's gonna and the site is actually infected with CoinHive scripts. Well, that's going to mine your GPU pretty massive. And what's the myth? You don't even bother to check it because when you play high-end games, your computer or your phone is going to get heated up. And when you have no difference saying, that, oh, yeah, I'm playing game for a long time. That's why it's heated up. So that's how it's being misused too. Uh, how to bypass this CoinHive proxy came into picture because several of the antivirus vendors were blocking these CoinHive scripts. So what CoinHive did was they release the proxy kind of a thing where uh, it says 30 percent commission so when you run the proxy it's gonna look out for a pool of miners over a VPN I assume and it's gonna connect to them so that it bypasses your you know, this is a way of bypassing it bypasses the other antivirus detections I just love love the entire portion there was actually a malware that hit Android phones it's called as a roaming mantis very interesting case study. Uh, what happened was everybody uses their phones today and Android phones, nobody bothers to read when it asks your permission. It's used to say yes, 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 and just you go on. Why would why would a pizza delivery app wants to access your calls or your contacts or your pictures? Are you gonna Yeah, that doesn't make sense. So Android is more vulnerable in this and PC malware. What happened was uh, users actually started getting, uh, this was actually targeted towards Japan. So each attack technically can be region specific, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, any country. So this was actually a region specific attack. So what happened was uh, folks in Japan started getting an SMS that said, uh, we are actually updating, I don't want to name what that app was, we are actually updating the app so you, are you a user with us for so many years and they got a SMS or an MMS kind of a thing and they clicked on it. The moment they clicked on it, it, it took them to a URL and it downloaded something which was apparently a fake update of an existing app saying your app is outdated, updated and people updated it. Well that what actually looked was it started using the phones, CPU, memory optimization kind of stuff and started mining coins. So roaming Mac mantis was 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 a famous malware, uh, which is just evolved over a period of time. And yeah, so that's one case. Okay, bizarre thing. What if I watch movies for free online? So imagine you're watching a leaked episode of Game of Thrones or a House of Cards or any Netflix shows. You that episode's probably not launched in your country yet. It's gonna out, be out next week. You quickly, sorry, you quickly Google and find out saying, oh, a free download of the Game of Thrones new episode. And what happens is you want to use a subtitle to, to watch it. So you go to the subtitle file site and download the subtitle file, which is a text file or an RTF file. What if coin hiving scripts are embedded in it and you have an outdated, outdated VLC player? Well, they're going to take a backdoor, use your computer, same process, mine use your computer because you're going to watch a movie for two hours and then probably you don't even notice it's going to heat up and you have no idea what's happening so that's one way of subtitle embedded malware and uh, or, you know to mine coins uh, this was actually uh, used as a google bombing concept where attackers add a lot of links so that when you search for that it comes as the first search you search so what do we do in Umbrella to stop these things? We have, our researchers are working tirelessly to stop such kind of attacks. So we use a model cover called as co-occurrence, which is very, very interesting developed by our uh, researchers. Uh, what it does is, there's a large tick. If there's a domain that's x.com is malicious and I can actually kind of figure out what is the infrastructure of the attack by knowing what are the domains access before and after. That means, say, I'm actually visiting a site 
and it redirects me to a new site that's going to be a redirect I'm going to block it if it's malicious what made me visit the site what are the stuff that I visited before and after is actually possible domain so we use a statistical model it's a lot of mathematics which I'm not really good at so I'm not going to get into it uh, we're going to look at those domains like this and see uh, and see it's malicious no, no. this is basically coinhive.com that I put it in our investigate Investigate is a dashboard or a UI that we have used popularly by a lot of sysadmins, network admins, research analysts all over the companies to see how your network activity is and block attacks uh, if it spreads and another bunch of really useful info to stop attacks. Uh, if you want to know more about Investigate, reach out to our sales folks and marketing folks, they can talk about it. So there's a concept called this co-occurrence in Investigate. Now for CoinHype, you see all these uh, URLs that I have marked saying malicious domains associated with phishing and redirect. So these might be pools. What happens is when you visit a site, it's going to redirect you to other sites or other pools. And all these are most of them are compromised sites. So that is, when I visit, when I run the coin mining script, it's going to talk to any of these sites. And uh, when you launch the site, it's going to help you in mining, and once it's done, it's going to interconnect to several other sites. So it just works as an infra. What if I block all these domains or IPs using Investigate? That's going to take down the entire infrastructure. Or, you see here, coin-hype.com, it's actually another mining script. If the mining is not probably working or it needs a redirect, if the other one is blocked, it just, it just you know, spreads like wildfire and, and mines. So all these domains that you see, we spoke about were cryptojack domains, hijack cryptojack domains that are showing coin miner hive scripts, and this is how they basically work. We have a new uh, security category in Umbrella. Our folks came up with this because coin mining has seen a steady, steady, steady rise in the last uh, several years. Uh, it's become a big attacking vector today. Uh, uh, with morning popularity, a uh, lot of uh, mining activities happening and we decided to add a security category to keep our corporate environment safe from unmine, unwanted mining activities. So this helps you to look for uh, crypto mining sites, we block it, uh, they're using JavaScript miners, we stop that, we have a pattern that we, we have researchers working on it, adding it to the block list. Uh, automatically and manually too and then we have a category even if you spot something in your environment that we have not blocked we can probably use a crypto mining category to stop it um, apart from that uh, you've got to be careful with a couple of things I mean uh, this is the new trend that's actually happening is everybody has an Amazon cloud or any cloud instances Linux boxes running or containers running Sometimes they have weak Kubernetes passwords running so that these are actually compromised and uh, they use a lot of cores and stuff. They run mining scripts silently and you got to be careful with that and spot those things and that's one way of, uh, you know, uh, running mining scripts too. So these, in a, in a nutshell, the summary, what we could speak about is uh, crypto mining is rapidly rising and uh, the crypto jacking is also catching up a lot and it's become a big news since off late where uh, it's adding to a list of malware that's silent, it's hard to find and a lot of companies are taking actions and we at Umbrella constantly monitor these domains and these would vary from geographical location to location and uh, it spreads like wildfire. We're on top of it, we make sure that our customers are safe and we work tirelessly to stop these attacks. So that's all I have. If you have any questions, you can shoot an email to me, shairamas at cisco.com. Probably hunt me down in LinkedIn. You can see me there too. Um, so that's all I have. Any questions that you guys have that I can, I can have answer take for you? Do we have questions? 
اوكي Uh, yeah, the iOS devices has a connector property that uh, there's a question saying how uh, umbrella protects for iOS devices, mobile devices. I think it's a connector that uh, protects you from specific Apple devices. So at DNS, if the whole concept of umbrella revolves around DNS and IP, even for the crypto tracking concept that I showed you guys just now, it's just domain names and IPs. They are the primary carrier of malware and using investigate and umbrella. So it's the logic is as simple as this. If you're in a corporate network, just point your uh, DNS resolver to our resolver. We're going to you know, stop all these attacks. You get all the feeds, in, all the all the threat feeds instantly, and we protect it. I think if it's got an any connect uh, thing, your queries are encrypted, and we stop you from all protect you from most of the attacks. And and yeah, for for the iOS device, that's how it works too. There's a connection for the iOS device that helps you to stay on top of the game and safe. Um, okay. Uh, license for the, the, the crypto mining domains, right? I think it's there. I think the category is already there, I'm assuming. You can still see the category if you have an existing subscription. You should still be able to block those. Uh, I think if you, if you probably want to see your dashboard, if you just hunt down your dashboard and see, for specific threats that were blocked in a day, probably you would see this crypto mining category too. It's there, it's there already. Or you can even, if you spot something that we have not blocked, you probably send saying that this is a crypto mining domain, you can add it to your own dashboard using the crypto mining category. Yeah, that's about that question. I took that question. Any other questions? Will Umbrella block mining while device is compromised? Yeah, so, it, the device in a sense, I mean, be it a PC or something, well, we'll just see where it's hosting the scripts, not the device itself. It's like, for example, if a customer is having a site, uh, that's it's a corporate site, and that's compromised, probably we'll block the domain that's serving the scripts, and a bunch of redirects, we'll track down the infra, and, uh, you know, stop these crypto hijacking. Basically, it's browser-based hijacking that we stop. That's what we do in that case. How do I figure out if my personal computer is being attacked? Okay, well, like, like various reasons. Probably just open your uh, browser and see if you're getting a bunch of hell of redirects that you didn't in, not intend to. Being one. Second is if you're just open your CPU and think if you're going to a lot of uh, free sites, say you're playing online games and stuff, and uh, just open up your CPU graph and see if it's shooting up massively if you visit to a particular site. Then that means uh, it's gonna be that you're probably visiting a crypto jacked site. Um, and otherwise, I mean, I mean, how do I say that if your computer's being attacked? It's all up to you to stay up with outdated, not outdated software, it's like a fresh, genuine copy of Windows that you have. I don't want anybody to probably run an XP machine which can be compromised. Buy genuine Windows. Uh, don't download stuff from torrents. Avoid those things. Don't don't try to convert a free version of a software to a full version of a software by just downloading cracks or patches. That patches might be a backdoor to your computer where it can be used as a mining pool too. So you never know. Be careful about those things. Uh, I found, if I found a server showing high CPU and memory and I doubt it's using it, what should I do? Well, that's a tricky question. You never, you need enough evidence to prove what that is. So, uh, uh, you can, you can probably, so let's, let's put from a product perspective. If you have investigate bugged, it can show you network connections where it's talking to if your server connected to our, probably have a server. You can see the outbound network connections going out and figure out if it's going to coin mining pools or the network transaction is the only way probably to find out that if you're being you know compromised or look for out unwanted softwares that you did not install in your server if it's for example it's a windows did you install a toolbar or check at your temp folder if there's a sample that you never downloaded so that might be doing the trick for you to take a backdoor or if it's URL based, then you can use investigate to see where it redirects. If someone actually wants to mine cryptocurrency and use his ask keys for it, is it possible that he might be blocked? In? Well, if you want to mine cryptocurrency the legit way, uh, you can actually do it using the legal 
way of things but i think we specifically block browser based crypto coin hive kind of a thing and it depends i mean see probably if you are legitly mining it and doing it with the legit way and if instead of connecting to a list of open source abused to free mining pools from your computer then it will definitely be blocked uh, but i mean at the moment we kind of seriously take a uh, dig at things like uh, browser based mining and uh, that's what we stop for now and yeah if as long as it's not a compromised server that it connects to as a mining pool you should be good umbrella will not block it uh, yeah yeah that's what i assume so might be wrong too but i think that's the answer closest answer i can give even if they are using my CPU and mining this way, is this well as possible for them to get into my personal data? You never know. That's a good question. So that's a very good question. So yeah, if they are getting into your computer and doing it, as long as that's it's a browser-based thing, it's totally fine. Because if you're visiting a compromised mining, a compromised site that's mining, you can just close the browser. The session dies basically. Uh, but if it's a your computer is used even after the browser is closed and massive mining spikes you see in your CPU then you might be compromised. It can be an outdated software, if you have clicked on an email maybe it's just taken a back door, you have an outdated SMB protocol if you're using Windows. So yeah, so a compromised computer can be used in several ways to host stuff. You can be used to host phishing mails, host ransomware, act as a command and control server where the other malware come and talk to you, drop more payloads, whatnot. So you never know. It can be used. As I was just saying, mentioning it, right? this also becomes one form of an attack which is catching up pretty fast. So yeah, you never know. It can be used that way. One of the possibilities. You need to do an investigation on that to see if it's being used or not. Also. Are we in the question land today? A lot of questions. Last question probably for the day. Okay. How to get Cisco product to save our environment from crypto mining? So probably I'll go on a marketing spree if I do it. But, well, Cisco has several products, uh, line of defense that you can actually use uh, at your network and your DNS level. You can have, you can have the umbrella products that you can monitor your uh, DNS requests, you can use policies to see what you're blocking, what you're watching, what you're not watching. If I go at the, you know, little bit down, a Veraki access point can be plucked to your investigate to see your wireless transactions, what's going into your Wi-Fi and stuff. That's one way. If you have a big corporate and enterprise network, then you can actually probably connect your, uh, you have a firewall, next generation firewall, that, that's the trick for you. or a combination or if you have a computer in an organization you can use AMP for endpoint. AMP for endpoint will spot for malicious signatures and block it right away and that threat and, and that when coupled with investigate dashboard is going to show you what are the network connections, what are the threat grid uh, samples that are actually being seen. So you have an array of products. You have Stealth Watch. Well that's going to, I'm going to need a separate session for it. Yeah, it's like a part of security portfolio and probably can talk to a sales and marketing team, reach out to any of them, they would give you, they would be really happy to give you a demo about it and if you had to come to Cisco Live, we would have showed you all these things as a live demo too, so yeah. I think, thank you so much ladies and gentlemen for patiently listening to me, I hope you guys enjoy the talk. If there are any questions, just shoot an email, you can see my email ID on screen, you can catch me LinkedIn too. And thank you guys. Have a good day. Ta-da. Bye-bye.